Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How do we do that? Find out next on The Crossover. We'll be right back. For nearly 2,000 years, Jews and Christians have been divided. But now, God is calling for the healing of past hurts and the comforting of His people. Discover how God is prophetically uniting Jews and Christians across the world today on The Crossover. Here is your host, Mitch Jerome. Welcome to The Crossover, and our special guest today is uh, Rabbi Dr. Richard Nichols, and he is the... Um, Messianic leader at Ruach Israel in Needham, Massachusetts for the past 30 years, and also a, the Dean of Students at MJTI, Messianic Jewish Theology Institute, and also the Director of the uh, Rabbinical Ordination Institute. He's a busy man, and thanks for taking the time, Rabbi, and coming on our show today. It's our, my pleasure, Mitch. Good Glad to, to have here. you. Yeah. Well, Rabbi, we're going to, we want you to share with us on kingdom living and Help us understand it for our viewers, or Jewish viewers, or Christian viewers that we have. And I thought I'd just start it off here by uh, reading when, when the disciples asked how to pray. Jesus had a prayer, which is now known as the Lord's Prayer. And uh, I think whether you be Jewish or Christian, this prayer, I think, has been heard by all kinds of people sure. out there. It's well known. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And... Um, I guess to start off here is this, since this is Yeshua speaking to his disciples there, et cetera, and the people, is this a Christian thing or is there anything here for the, the, the Jewish people also? Well, what's so interesting about the, the Lord's Prayer is that it really follows the pattern of one of the most famous synagogue prayers, one of the oldest synagogue prayers called the Amidah or the Shemona Esra. And so the themes of the Lord's Prayer and even some of the ordering of the prayer fit what eventually developed into the prayer that we have in our modern prayer books, the Amidah. So first it was from the Amidah. It, oh. Yeah, it was part of that same uh, set of ideas okay. that gradually got written down and got transmitted in the Jewish prayer book, but the Lord's Prayer, of course, uh, comes from Yeshua, and so it's, he's living here and teaching here within, within entirely Jewish space. So, Rabbi, how do we know how to bring heaven to earth, as it states there? Maybe the first thing we should talk about is the Hebrew behind that concept of, of heaven coming to earth. The technical term is Malkut Hashemayim, the kingdom of heaven. And essentially the idea is that God desires that His rule and his plan, his laws, his Torah, if you will, mm -hmm. is expressed in Israel and among the nations so that we could all be happy, well taken care of, blessed human beings with blessed children and blessed grandchildren. So that's the basic concept. And how do we get there? For all that's, the nations you're saying. Oh, absolutely. Well, in Malkut HaShemayim, of course, the idea in the world of Jesus and in the world of ancient rabbis is that Israel is the conduit, it's the, it's the pipeline by which God brings Malkut HaShemayim, the kingdom of God, okay. to the world. But the kingdom of God is not intended only for Israel, but is intended for the entire world. And so uh, it, Jesus understood it very similarly to the way it developed in Rabbinic Judaism. But in terms of the basic concept, God's rule, His ways in this world, and even beyond that, his presence through the Messiah in our world. It's all part of that same complex of ideas. When I was looking at your uh, MJTI catalog and the mission statement there said, teaching and living a vision of Jewish life renewed in Yeshua. So to me, you're alluding to kingdom living just in that statement alone. And it got me thinking, as a raised as a conservative Jew myself, going to temple three times a year would be probably max, and not just a lot of tradition. How would how do you make a leap from that to all of a sudden living the Jewish life renewed in Yeshua? Seems like that's a big uh, assertion there to go from one to to the other. Well, as we know, and it's true in the Jewish community, it's true in the Christian community that not everyone is equally enthusiastic and enthralled with the things of God. 
And that's a sad thing. It's true, as you say, growing up in the conservative synagogue, you found that people were distracted with all kinds of different things. And, and you yourself probably weren't at that time thinking so deeply about these things. And from what I understand in the, Jewish, in the Christian community, it's a very similar situation where you have a whole gradation, a whole different set of, of uh, affections and, and ways of relating to the things of God. For me personally, the gap was filled through the Messiah, the, the person I consider to be the Messiah, we consider to be the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. In other words, when I came to understand that He is the harbinger of and the bringer of Malkut HaShemayim, the Kingdom of God, that He's the focal point of the Kingdom of God, God used that to bring me personally from a point of blasé, of um, not a terrible amount of concern about these things, to a point of His getting my attention and bringing me to the passion of a concern about helping to cooperate with God to bring Malkut HaShemayim, the Kingdom of God. So Rabbi Richard, what, what can you briefly tell us, what was that going from, sounds like dead wood, to being on fire there? What happened in your life at, the, at that point that changed? To make a long story short, I was a uh, music major at Ithaca College in New York, mm -hmm. and uh, I met some, some believers, and one of them was Jewish fellow, and the other was non-Jewish, and they told me about the Messiah. And of course, initially, I wasn't going to believe what they had to say, but they gave me some very provocative literature. One was a book called The Late Great Planet Earth, which was very popular. You may remember it in the early 70s, and it was about biblical prophecy. And I had never known that there was anything in the Bible about biblical prophecy, predictions of future events, and that was very interesting. And then they gave me a little book. I think it was called Jesus and the Intellectual. And the idea of that book was that there were various people throughout history who wanted to disprove the claims of Yeshua. Yeshua, we call him Yeshua. Jesus yeah. is Yeshua. Uh, they wanted to disprove his claims, but upon investigating them, they found that it looked like they were really true claims. For example, General Lew Wallace was a Civil War general, and uh, he decided he wanted to disprove the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection that after three days in the grave he came back to life again. And uh, so he investigated it w thoroughly and in a very intellectual fashion, and he came away saying, oh my, it looks like it really happened, that the resurrection actually is an historical event, and the net result is he became a follower of the Messiah and wrote the very famous book, Ben-Hur which, of course, we saw in the movies when we, were, sure. when we were kids. So those things impressed me. And the other thing that impressed me was the quality, the, the way the young people I met came across. Uh, they would have meetings, and they would round up college kids, and uh, they would talk to them about God and about the Messiah. And I was impressed that young men, guys my age, 19, 20, would get up and speak so vulnerably about themselves and their their a desire for something more meaningful in life and how the Messiah filled that. And I thought it took a lot of guts, a lot of internal fortitude for these young people to stand up and express themselves so uh, unselfconsciously and yet unpresumptuously. It was, it was a naturalness to it all. It didn't seem staged. And I was with this fellow John, the Jewish guy, and I asked him the ultimate question. The ultimate question was, if I believe in Jesus, Am I going to have to give up trombone? <laughs> that, listen, for me, trombone was my identity. Okay. In a sense, it was like an idol, but it was my identity. And he said a wise thing. He said, he said, Rich, I don't know what God will take out of your life, but whatever he takes out, he'll put something back that's better. To be true. And I was completely disarmed. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it. What I meant by doing it was I was going to tell God that I believe this to be true. And I... I don't remember my words, the words of my prayer. I really don't remember them, but I remember the sentiment. The idea was, God, I believe in you. I believe you're the God of Israel. I believe in Jesus, the Messiah. We didn't refer to him as, as Yeshua in those days because our Jewish identities had not been completely formed as a movement. But I believe in him, and I want to be forgiven, and I want to walk with you, and words to that effect. But what I do remember is as soon as I opened up my eyes, I felt a profound sense of peace mixed with forgiveness, mixed with well-being. Uh, the way I've described it for many years is before God and I in some way were like this. Not completely. I believed in Him and I, I really did, but, but I wasn't really 
passionate about him. I wasn't concerned about him or Malkut HaShemayim, the kingdom of God, but now we were like this. We'll be right back. More of The Crossover when we return. The Crossover presents Biblical Arts. Welcome back to The Crossover. Welcome back to The Crossover. Today's show is Thy Kingdom Come, and uh, Rabbi Dr. Richard Nichols is with us. And uh, we were just talking about the kingdom and a little bit different understanding between uh, Christians and the Jewish way of looking at it. And you were going to just share something with us here on that, uh, Doctor. Sure. Uh, well, the kingdom of God in Jewish thinking and particularly modern Jewish thinking, is an age. It's a golden age. It's an age of peace and justice in the world. The Christian understanding includes that, but the Christian understanding has a focal point, and I would include the Messianic Jewish understanding, not just the Christian, historically Christian understanding, but the Messianic Jewish as well, that the Malkut HaShemayim, the kingdom of God, focuses on the bringer of that kingdom, who we understand to be the Mashiach, the Messiah, who comes again. He was here one time, he'll be back again. That, that really is the critical difference. Now, I should clarify a little further. Orthodox Jews or traditional Jews also think of the kingdom in terms of the personal presence of the Messiah, but he's not a known person. He's an unknown person at this point. We would say, we know who's going to show up. We feel quite confident that the one who rose from the dead is and who left his disciples in Jerusalem will be back to Jerusalem to usher in the fullness of the kingdom. And again, unlike the more modern uh, Jewish understanding, it's not just an age which is brought about by human evolutionary process. 
Rather, the kingdom is ultimately ushered in by the bringer of the kingdom, the Messiah, Yeshua. Yeah. So in, in the world that we're living in today, let's bring this down to earth. <laughs> this is what the, the message is, is how, how do we, you know, we've got right now tough ep economic times. Unemployment employment they're saying is 10%. We know it's a whole lot higher than that because of the way they calculate it. Um, people losing homes, jobs, um, just um, financial situation, obviously, uh, shrinking of the middle class, a lot of stress. So how do you, what, this, this relationship with the Lord in this day, I'm looking at David probably could have taken away a lot of couch time for Saul. How do you make that practical today? How do, how do people plug in here and apply it in the real world that they're living? How will people survive should there be a major economic downturn or a major period of social unrest and insecurity? My best suggestion for everyone is ask yourself the question, how am I related to the king? Do I believe that God exists? I think it's a very reasonable question. And study that out and ask people who think they have an answer and come to some conclusions about that. And at the end of the day, what I hope America will do, and I hope this for all the nations of the world, including Israel, to help facilitate bringing Malkut HaShemayim, the return of the Messiah, uh, when we make teshuva, that is, when we turn, when we repent, when we deal with the subtle but powerful idols in our lives and begin recognizing that God is the reference point, Messiah is the reference point, that our sense of security and well-being has to be a function of our relationship with Him primarily, and that we can no longer look to an ever-expanding economic picture for that sense of security. When we get to that point, then we're going to be okay. And even if there is a significant economic downturn, even if there are tough times coming, the strength and fortitude and ability to stand strong and to be happy even in the midst of it, it it's can only come from that relationship with, with God. Either we uh, take our own will to make that relationship with God and find it worthy, or some kind of calamity will probably force us to look up. It'll, if we don't do it on our own, life may create the situation to draw close to God. I think you're right. Usually happens that way, right? So Rabbi, I just want to tell you an experience that happened to me last year. I went to a day of learning downtown at um, uh, one of the synagogues, and it was open to the community. And it was wonderful, different classes, different rabbis, different teachings going on. But I had one encounter with a wonderful rabbi there that really shook me when he was basically saying how uh, the Jewish base in the synagogue, I guess that he represented or in general, don't know if he was speaking generally there, was shrinking. No young people coming, older people, boom. And then he went on to teach a class, and that was a, a prelude, then he went on to teach a class on how there's really no miracles in the Bible, they're allegories. So after class, I basically raised my hand there and said, you know, Rabbi, I think I know why no one's coming. It's because there's no hope being taught because you're taking the power out of the, the Word by, the, by, by doing that. So we had a little dialogue, and that was that. So I say that just to say that um, I believe the Messianic segment of Judaism is growing more leaps and bounds than the other traditional houses, and I believe it's because they take the Word of God as the Word of God, and it's a, a living Word. The problem in much of the religious world is there is this spirit of skepticism which causes people to be so desensitized and blinded to the possibility of such things that you could trip over them and you wouldn't even know they're occurring. And, and that is something that really needs to be corrected. You're absolutely right. At our school, which is the Messianic Jewish Theological Institute, we're a graduate school to train Messianic Jewish rabbis. I like to say this, give me a hundred young people who know the Bible, know Jewish texts, Mishnah, Talmud, Codes, etc., are schooled in the languages, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, who know theology, who walk in the power of the Spirit, that is, people who know how to pray in faith for other people, and lastly, young people who know how to love people and are motivated by love. You give me those hundred people to study at MJTI, we change the world. Yeah. We change the world. And we've got some of them already in training. So I'm right with you. I think the living reality of God, His presence, the living 
presence of God a kind of foretaste of Malkut HaShemayim, the kingdom of God. Right. One day, the whole world experienced these things. We can experience them partially, but meaningfully, even right now, because the Messiah is alive and well, and God yearns for people, just yearns for people, to say, open up your eyes, look around. There's something going on here. I'm doing stuff, and I love you, I'm with you, and I want to bless and take care of you. That is Malkut HaShemayim. Well, you catch that message there because God's got a, his heart for you. And Rabbi Rich just said it eloquently and heartfelt, period. Listen, we appreciate you coming on the show. We're, My pleasure, Our Rich. time has come and, and gone here, and we'll, hopefully next time you're in town we can continue. We'll be back in a moment. We hope you enjoyed the show, and you're going to hear right now Rabbi Rich uh, play. And then uh, we have a word for you from the king himself. Stay tuned. I'm Jim Becker. I've been a journalism teacher for many years and actually I wrote my first newspaper story in 1973. And I've seen the world change a whole lot in that time, covering a lot of different stories. But one thing that upsets me a little bit, and this is what I teach my students, is that truth can never be bested by falsehood in the public arena. But what happens when so much of what you see in the media is not the truth? and it's overbearingly, blatantly bad, or anti-good. Anti and that's why I was really concerned. That's why I think that uh, the crossover can be a powerful instrument in reaching people, because it's actually proclaiming the truth, the positive side of a lot of different things, and reaching out to people. For nearly 2,000 years, Jews and Christians have been divided. But now, God is calling for the healing of past hurts and the comforting of His people. Discover how God is prophetically uniting Jews and Christians across the world today on The Crossover. The Crossover exists to communicate to the Jewish community that there is a growing group of Christians who love them unconditionally. The focus of the crossover program is to promote a greater understanding of the differences and similarities between Jewish and Christian customs, history, and theology, while encouraging a closer walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As a second-generation Holocaust survivor, Rosalie's Jewish heritage includes parents who were protected from the Nazis by Christians. Yet for more than a decade, Mitch and Rosalie searched for meaning in life in the New Age movement. 
but after returning to their Judeo-Christian roots, they discovered God's purpose for their lives, to rebuild bridges between Christians and Jews. Now through TV, radio, the internet, speaking engagements, the healing room, and print and video resources, they are reuniting Jews and Christians in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Join Mitch and Rosalie as they tackle tough topics and welcome dynamic guests on The Crossover. The Promised Land. And I also try to make it very clear to the Christians all over the world that they are threatened to the same extent as the Jews and Israel are threatened. Uh, and I also say basically that Jews and Christians are waiting for the Messiah, who is a Jew from Israel who speaks Hebrew. And that Messiah is going to come to Jerusalem. And so Christians share this faith with the Jews. The Hebraic roots of Christianity. And we begin looking at Jesus through Jewish spectacles and not our Texas spectacles. Here again, Mitch and Rosalie Jerome. Lately in prayer time, Rosalie's been receiving, we call them letters from God, love letters from God. And uh, today's the last day of Sukkot, Tabernacles, and she got one today for you. Here it is. All right. So in my sukkah, uh, today is Hoshana Rabbah, the Lord would say, join me in my pursuits of kingdom power, kingdom living, kingdom lifestyle. I yearn to impart to my children the intimate secrets and keys to my kingdom. Come to me, serve me, and awaken to the call of your very maker, your Lord of Lords, your King of Kings. Join me, my children. Love everlasting, power indescribable, joy everlasting. Come to the quiet place. Meditate on my words, my goodness, and my great love that I have for you and the world to come. Join me in the quiet hour. Let me restore your soul as we repair the world. I lie here awaiting for you. Thank you for watching the crossover today. We hope the, our show touched you. Please let us know your comments Remember, these are prophetic times, and God is at work. Shalom. Shalom. Join Mitch and Rosalie as they reach an ever-growing worldwide audience through the crossover. We invite you to become a crossover partner right now by calling the number on your screen. For your monthly gift of $30 or more, you will receive the Crossover Partnership Pack, which includes a DVD of today's program, a personal greeting and prayer message from Mitch and Rosalie, more information about the Crossover Project. As you continue to support the Crossover each month, you will receive a new Crossover DVD, plus a ministry report, and your name will be added to our healing room. Call now and join the growing family of Crossover Partners.